this revision clip, we're going to be looking at the key historical debate about whether the inhabitants of the city of Rome were better off living under an emperor rather than the previous republic. Now, in order to answer a question on this, there's two ways of doing this. First of all, you could look at answering this question thematically, looking at the issue of grain, of games and largesse amongst all five Julio-Claudian emperors. Or you could write an answer and respond to a modern historian by discussing emperor by emperor. For the sake of revision and revising chronologically, we're going to use this revision clip in an emperor by emperor basis. So first of all, let's look at Augustus. Importantly, at the time that Octavian returns to Rome after the defeat of Antony and Cleopatra in 31 BC, Rome has still had a lengthy experience throughout its history of grain shortages and grain problems. Rome had had a major issue in terms of supplying its city with food for a range of reasons. First of all, the increase in population, a population used to receiving the grain dole, uncertain harvests, and as evidenced earlier in Octavian's career with the conflict of Sextus, uh, with Sextus Pompey, there was an issue of pirates affecting the grain supply. You could look further back in Rome's history and see Pompey and the Lex Gabinia of 67 BC as a response um, to, to a similar problem. So with Octavian or the newly christened Augustus now in sole control of Rome, certainly we can see a range of methods used to improve the living standards of the population of the city. And none more so is this evidence than the res gestae. The res gestae, obviously you'll need to discuss the analysis of the usefulness of the res gestae and certainly res gestae will be highlighting key examples of Augustus's generosity as Augustus will have wanted this in order to highlight the positive relationship he had with the vast majority of Romans and the different social groups and, and classes in the city. Res Gestae in particular has three key verses which really do demonstrate Augustus's generosity to the people. So firstly in verse 15 we've got a whole discussion about money, grants, and largesse given to the people. So verse 15, we've got lots and lots of examples. We've got the payment resulting from Caesar's will in 44 BC of 300 sesterces. We've got a gift of 400 sesterces to each citizen in 29. Uh, again, in 24 um, BC, we've got um, grain grants as well. 400 sesterces for the third time in 11 BC. Uh, by his 12th consulship, 240 sesterces each to 320,000 members of the urban plebs. Uh, and in his 13th consulship in 2 BC, a further 60 denarii apiece to the plebs. So some great examples of generosity to the population of Rome. Similarly, in verse 22 and 23, we've got about the entertainments and the games that Augustus introduced. So, for instance, we have gladiatorial games being discussed, the secular games, the games of Mars, beasts, hunts, and na a naval, mock naval uh, battle that's put on for the people. So we've got lots of examples of generosity in res gestae. However, the key thing to consider is does this generosity have some type of suspicious timing. Certainly, there's a pattern where every time there is a gift, there is some type of constitutional change or shift, whether that's the return after the defeat of Antony and Cleopatra, or whether that's the first settlement, the second settlement, or introducing his grandsons to official life, therefore setting up a monarchy later on in his reign. Suetonius is really positive about Augustus and the improvements that he makes for the city of Rome in his 
coverage of Augustus. In verse 41, he talks about his generosity to all classes displayed on many occasions. He talks about his largesse and also discusses about how Augustus responded to food shortages, supplying grain at a cheap rate or even free. Importantly, verse 42, though, does say that Augustus did this to improve the city and lives for the citizens, not for his own popularity. He did it to improve public welfare. And there's a great anecdote where the citizens, the people, complain about the scarcity of wine. And Augustus responds that Agrippa, his son-in-law, has made adequate provision for thirsty citizens by building several aqueducts. Um, you also see, again, a little bit of a telling off, a ticking off and some control over plebs when they demand largesse that's not been promised them, and he calls them a pack of shameless rascals. And finally, we've got the discussion of the grain dole uh, to the people, and the idea that Augustus would discontinue the supply of grain, but didn't want to because in future he was concerned that a politician would revive the grain dole in order to ingratiate himself with the people. Finally, in verse 43, we get the idea of aims and shows again. And this really corroborates what Res Gestai is talking about in terms of the Moxie battles, the beast hunts and the games. What's particularly noteworthy in verse 43, though, is Augustus's uh, banning of the Troy game in response to the criticism of, uh, of polio in the Senate and also the injury to a couple of young Romans. Strabo's geography, which is pretty much a contemporary source, likewise corroborates this positive relationship. Strabo, again, is not writing from any particular political agenda, so it's pretty reliable. He talks about how Augustus creates a fire brigade in order to deal with the frequent fires. You could link this with certainly Rufus and the Vigiles. There's also some type of building restrictions as well. Obviously, we know that these are not going to be completely successful, as we'll have the Great Fire of Rome under uh, Nero and other examples of fires as well throughout, throughout the reigns of the Julio Claudians. But Strabo is essentially positive. Likewise, he talks about how Agrippa's aqueducts really improve the supply of water coming into the city. He discusses the sewers, the certainly the improvement of the cloaca maxima, the cisterns, and the, uh, the pipes and fountains. So Strabo certainly corroborates what Suetonius is saying about the improvements of Rome for the people. However, these improvements go hand in hand with negatives. And certainly you could see in the same period, whilst there are undoubtedly improvements from the vast majority of people in the city, certainly far more than there would have been uh, under the Republic, they do lose pretty much all of their political influence, whether that comes with the tribunes, the popular assemblies, or even Augustus's control over the selection of local magistrates. Tacitus really sort of, sort of sums this up when he talks about Augustus seducing the army with gifts and the people with corn and everyone with the enjoyable gifts of peace. Let's look at Tiberius. And um, for Tiberius, you've got the typical view of Tiberius as stingy, which you certainly get from Suetonius. Suetonius maintains that Tiberius was close fisted to the point of miserliness. Now, where the, uh, the key material is here is in verse 47 and verse 48. Because what Suetonius mentions in verse 47 and 48 is that Tiberius was responsible for no magnificent public works. However, could you say that because of Augustus and Agrippa et al's um, building programs, is there a real need for new public works? Uh, he gave no public shows at all and didn't attend those given by others because he didn't want to be asked for anything. And Suetonius also mentions that even though Tiberius did relieve the financial distress of some senators, he announces that that's going to be restricted. Again, is this really stinginess? Um, a good example of that is uh, of Hortolus, the 
uh, the grandson of the famous orator Hortensius, who asks for aid. And certainly we're told that Tacitus, by Tacitus rather, that Hortalus actually gained this aid. This is the generosity. Well, actually, despite Suetonius telling us that Tiberius is actually stingy, we actually do see quite a degree of generosity. So we've got the public loan of a million sesterces in order to boost the economy. Um, we've got the response to the uh, to another fire in Rome, where the the hill is re, uh, rebuilt and renamed the Augustan. We've actually got some reasonable generosity to the army, but then this is poo pooed because Suetonius mentions that Tiberius only gives them their pay. There's also a response to an earthquake in Asia. So even though Suetonius is writing this really critically about Tiberius, what we can actually see is that there are some positives, even in this negative portrayal of Tiberius. We've got the cut of expenditure. And importantly, we've got no gladiatorial shows. Um, and it's the plebs that really resent this. So much so, Tacitus tells us that when he dies, the citizens cry to the Tiber with Tiberius. However, can we say that Tiberius's retreat to Capri actually has a massive effect on his standing with the people? Do remember that there is a really positive source that does discuss Tiberius and mentions that he's really beneficial for the inhabitants of Rome. And that source is the contemporary Valeus. Now, Again, we'll need to analyze and assess Valeus as a source, but actually Valeus does mention positives about Tiberius's control and uh, reign for the, inhab the inhabitants of the city. Certainly, he says that he gives the Senate their magisterial, magisterial authority back, but he talks about the stability of the grain price, the idea that there's no riots. So there are some real positives for people from Tiberius' reign. He's generous to the people and saves senators from poverty. So we can actually see that Valeus actually corroborates some of those positives discussed by Suetonius. Let's look at Gaius. Now, he's a really interesting figure if we're talking about the benefits and the, and the improvements of, of imperial rule for the city. Now, unlike Tiberius, who had really restricted public entertainments and, and largesse, Gaius really indulged the people in those. And as a result, you could me certainly make the argument that Gaius is incredibly popular with the actual people of Rome. We get um, some detail from Suetonius. Now, remember, Suetonius is writing from a senatorial and aristocratic, well, senatorial point of view. So obviously wouldn't be too positive about Gaius's re relationship with the people. But again, sneaking into Suetonius, we do see some positives. So in verse 18, we see the gladiatorial contest, the theatrical shows with scattered vouchers, all day games in the circus and spur of the moment games where um, passersby say to, to guys, hey, fancy a day's racing and they put it on for them. We also see in verse uh, 21 in particular, again, some improvements for the people. This 20s where we see the bridge at Bayer being constructed and we talk and we have some discussion of the shows abroad. But in verse 21, we do see the completed projects that supposedly Tiberius had neglected and worked beginning on an aqueduct, which would be later on completed by Claudius. So there are some positives in Suetonius's coverage on Gaius. Moreover, if we're focusing on the actual inhabitants of the city of Rome, we can actually corroborate some of these positives with Cassius Dio, who talks about the financial aid given to the victims of a fire. Um, he talks about the great satisfaction by many of Gaius's measures with the people. Finally, for Gaius, we can look at the reaction of the people to his assassination. And certainly what we can see is that there is a tension between the Senate and the people in regard to their view of having an emperor and the benefits of having an emperor. And we can get that from the Flavian historian Josephus. Josephus 
gives us the idea of the atmosphere following Gaius' assassination when the Senate are attempting to bring back the Republic and the people and the army are against this. And this wonderful quote, the people on the other hand had no love for the Senate and realised that the emperors acted as a curb for its rapacity and were a source of protection for themselves. So Josephus is certainly saying that these emperors benefit the people far more than senatorial government such as the Republic would have offered them. Our next emperor, Claudius, also seems to have a reasonably positive relationship with the people. Certainly the way that his accession had, had worked out, that that is the one that gives the reason why there's tension with the Senate. But certainly with the people, Claudius seems to have, a, have had a reasonably positive relationship. Again, Duetonius mentions the draining of the Fusine Lake. Um, he talks about the creation of the new port um, of, of Portus. We've got the aqueducts, the Aqua Claudia and the, and the, uh, and the Anio, largesse and new, uh, a magnificent public shows. Uh, similar to Augustus, he stages the secular games. Uh, and again, what, uh, chariot races and wild shows. So Claudius is very similar to Augustus in the way that he's trying to benefit the inhabitants of the city. We've also the extent of the Troy game and the mock battles. Suetonius is really closely corroborated by a contemporary source, a really useful contemporary source to us, and that's Pliny. Um, and Pliny discusses, again, the improvement that Claudius's reign has brought to many of the inhabitants of the city. And he talks about the aqueducts, the abundant water supply, and he's talking about how the aqueducts and, and the, the water supply is actually one of the greatest achievements in the whole world when you consider the engineering behind the construction. So Pliny is really similar in his praise to Suetonius. Finally, Nero. Let's look at him. Now, again, Nero has this tyrannical reputation, and certainly Suetonius, Tacitus, and Dio all give us ample examples of Nero's tyranny. However, if we're looking at Nero's relationship with the people, again, we can see positives even in these hostile accounts. So if we look at Tacitus on the aftermath of the Great Fire of Rome, we can actually see that Nero supposedly does a fair bit in order to alleviate suffering in the actual uh, fire, but then also to attempt to prevent it ever happening again. So what we get in these uh, two areas is we've got the idea that he, um, he opens his private gardens, there's emergency accommodation, food is brought in, the price of grain is cut. So in the immediate aftermath, there's some real uh, measures to try and improve things for the people. And then we've actually got attempts to make sure that this never happens again. So the rebuilding of Rome with building regulations, broad streets, spacious houses, Nero spending money on this as well, the public water supply being improved again. And actually, these measures were welcomed for their practicality and beautified the new city. So the people being supportive of these. Hilariously, you've still got the old mood hoovers at the bottom who are complaining that the narrow streets had actually been great in the previous city because it had protected against the sun and now actually the big streets make it far more uh, uh, warmer. So hilariously, you're always going to get some criticism. Suetonius, again, just like Tacitus, has a largely negative view of Nero, but even Suetonius has some positives for Nero and his reign on the actual inhabitants of the city. He talks about firefighting platforms, um, public abuses suppress sumptuary laws to check on extravagance and luxury. We've got uh, careful monitoring of the grain supply, completion of Claudius's aqueducts and portus, and 400 sesterces given to the people on two occasions. In addition, aid given to alleviate the suffering of an earthquake, just like Tiberius had done. So we do have some positives. However, that being said, Suetonius's coverage does show that Nero did lose the support of the people towards the end of his reign and in response to the revolts that he was being faced with and certainly the actions 
um, that Nero was putting into place in order to deal with these revolts, such as the Amazons, the prostitutes that were to be equipped uh, to take um, with him in order to deal with the revolting governors, the taxes, the profiteering from grain. And despite the, some of the positives that Suetonius mentions to us, Suetonius f um, finishes his coverage um, with Nero just before his suicide by saying that he was universally loathed. So the important thing is with our governors, is that so with our emperors rather, is that for each emperor, we can make the argument that there are either positive relationships with the people or even in the case of Tiberius, that there are some positive actions 